Hey. <laughs> okay, so first of all, we're still in the experimental phase with the widescreen. <laughs> I'm hoping it works. But the other thing is, it's been snowing for the past couple days. So the squeaking that you may hear is our heater working overdrive. <laughs> and any noise we hear out there, the cars trying to go up and down the snow covered streets. We'll give them a pass this time. Okay. <laughs> A huge pass. So this is a thing. I wanted to talk about somebody in history. And um, because I restored and colorized a picture of this person, and I've become a fan of them ever since. So um, let's just get right into it, shall we? <laughs> so this particular individual is named William Julian Dalton. Their stage name is Julian Eltinge. We're just going to call him Julian because I don't think I'm saying that name right. <laughs> so he was born in 1881 in Boston. And um, apparently he appeared, th this is the thing, is he was an American stage film actor, and I'm, I'm just, I'm everywhere right now. <laughs> but he became famous as a female impersonator. Okay. <laughs> so, in his day, it was known as a female impersonator. Now, it's called drag queen. So, um... Yeah, and the reason that I'm stopping here and kind of explaining it is because I hear it all the time. I'm like, these people who are like, oh my gosh, drag queen, oh my gosh, why get, ah, you know, and um, I hear it a lot. <laughs> I mean, the people that are just so outraged over RuPaul's uh, drag race and everything, it's like, just don't watch it, you know? <laughs> And, and everything. But the thing is, is that when I was researching Julian, it turns out that during the years of vaudeville, female impersonators were as popular, those acts were as popular as RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. So um, <laughs> for people to act like um, like drag queens are like this new thing. Not really. They just had a different name. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> um, I try to be extremely respectful. And so it, in his day, they were called female impersonators, but I'm just going to go ahead and continue with saying drag queen just to clear up any confusion. <laughs> so anyway, So yeah, he was born in Boston. Now, this is why it gets so confusing and why I was a little jumbled earlier is because a lot of sources are just kind of like, there's three different stories having to do with his childhood. So I guess they are all connected with the fact that he started, um, he first dressed as a girl, you know, in, in a dress at the age of 10 with the Boston Cadets Review. But then it just, it shifts into one story saying he uh, played the role so well that the next year he, he was, um, with he, he played minor roles with the the cadet review, and then he later performed as a female, um, like a decade later with the cadets and all of that. 
And then another story talks about how he was taking lessons from a dance studio and he demonstrated to the teacher this amazing ability to emulate a female. And um, so then his instructor encouraged him to study the art of female impersonation so that he could then go on vaudeville and do those, do the female impersonated drag queen acts. And um, the other reason would be because boys often played female roles in all male theater groups. And um, kind of like uh, Shakespeare's day because of the fact that women were forbidden to uh, perform on stage, the men would play the female roles. And, um, but so there's those two stories and then you have this story. It's like, oh my goodness. And um, it says his father was a mining engineer. Okay. And so at some point, uh, Julian went to live with his dad in Montana. So he's out west. And so Julian is this teenager wearing women's clothing, going into the saloons. And, <laughs> And, uh, and and performing, so he would perform in the saloons and everything as a in 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 this in these women's clothes, and of course the ranchers and the miners would would give him trouble and everything. I have a hard time believing this story because it was like it says as a teenager he did this. Now in 1899, apparently he was 17. I would think his father would have found out sooner, and uh, I mean. Uh, yeah, it, that one, I I don't know. I just, I, I have a hard time with that one because the dots don't seem to connect. I would believe that his father, because it then says that his father found out and, and beat him. I would believe that the dad beat Julian because, you know, of finding his son wearing women's clothing. That I would agree with. So anyway, um, at some point, Julian is working in a general food store and he's also studying to dance. Now, <laughs> whichever story you want to take, <laughs> go for it. it went, oh my gosh, it was like, <laughs> yeah, I didn't think it'd be that hard to figure out which one. Oh my goodness. And, um, and and before you get the wrong idea, yes, I'm I'm on Wikipedia right now. But even outside of Wikipedia, it's like his childhood is just very spotty. Uh, ugh. Anyway, so Julian, when he was a kid, he was friends with Pauline Frederick. They reunited. You know, they lost touch and then reunited at a boarding school in Boston. Now, he was already making a name for himself in vaudeville. And it doesn't say if they were, you know, when, which makes it frustrating. It's like, how old were they? <laughs> how old? But friends being friends, he dared her to apply to one of the music halls. And that started off her career in stage and film. And, uh, you know, it's funny how a lot of these um, stories end up how it was due because of a dare or somebody saying, you should do this, you know, much like Mary Pickford with um, Florence. Which, Have you ever thought of moving pictures? You know? <laughs> and uh, Roscoe Arbuckle. And he is the reason that uh, Bob Hope is in, you know, had, yeah. And um, he found Bob Hope. Uh, that's basically what I'm trying to say. Anyway, so Julian's Broadway career started off in 1904 
with the musical comedy Mr. Wicks of Wickham. Now, I swear I have heard that <laughs> title before. I'm going to have to look it up, and I should have before I sat down and did this video, but I, I know I've heard that. I'm probably one of the other stage performers that I've um, been introduced to. But anyway, so that was the musical comedy that he um, was in. Now, he was also in a lot of other Broadway, I mean, a lot of other, he was still in vaudeville. That's basically what I'm saying. He was still doing his uh, vaudeville act. The thing to understand when he was, um, what set him apart from the other female impersonators was the other impersonation, the other impersonator acts, <laughs> getting all kinds of mixed up but no when um the other acts they had a character um he presented the illusion of actually being a woman so basically the woman one and the same he and and uh if that makes sense. <laughs> not like, and I know I use her a lot. I am a huge fan of her. It's not like Cassandra Peterson and Elvira. That's what a lot of the other female impersonators would do. So you had the, the man and the woman. And um, no, he morphed them together. One and the same. He toured simply as Eltinge. And I know I'm butchering that name. I swear I'm not saying that correctly. And this is, this is the other thing that made him, that separated him from others. So his act, he left his sex unknown. Now when I restored and colorized the photo that I did of him, I really did think that Julian was a woman. And so when I was looking up Julian, <laughs> I was like, I was shocked. I was like, oh my gosh, it's it's a man in person. So yeah, he, he and um, I, I thought it was marvelous, absolutely marvelous. So his act was singing and dancing and there were costume changes for these, what he's, what is said to be female roles. And um, instead of like sketches or acts or you know within the act uh during this time of course gibson girls were big and um so he called it his uh like parody i guess you would call it of that was known as the samson girl i would have loved to see that i love i love learning about this stuff and and just their humor it, it's fantastic it shows that people don't change <laughs> they love oh parodies and puns i love it now at the end of his act he would remove his wig and it, the audience would be surprised be like wait a minute i thought we were watching a woman this whole time <laughs> and um which uh, you know, nowadays, people are so quick to spoil everything. That's one of the reasons why I don't watch uh, Marvel movies anymore. I, I got tired of, you know, and you can make the argument, well, just don't watch the internet. It's like, you know what? Maybe just keep your mouth shut. <laughs> There's a thought. Just because you saw it doesn't mean that everyone else saw it, you know? There's something to think about. But, it, you know... I just, when people are just flooding the internet with the spoiler, yeah. So when people were actually, when the audience every time was, they were surprised, yeah. Shows how, maybe you should learn something. Don't spoil it for others. I said it, you can be mad, I don't care. Now, two years after his 
uh, Broadway debut, he uh, made his London debut at the Palace Theatre. And while he was there, he actually gave a performance to King Edward VII. That's big stuff. And uh, he was only there for a year because he came back and uh, in 1907, and he made a New York debut at a particular theater. I am not going to even try to say that. But at a particular theater, and he had critical acclaim. And uh, yeah, they, there were critical reviews on his performance. Then the next year in 1908 through 1909, he toured with Cohen and Harris Minstrels. And um, not to be confused, I'll have to double check on that, not to be confused with George M. Cohen. Not, <laughs> no, not the same Cohen. Then in 1910, by 1910, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> oh my goodness. Breathe, Bunhead, breathe. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> oh my goodness. You can make fun of me. <laughs> I make fun of myself. 1910. Let's try the right one. <laughs> By 1910... <laughs> That's when Julian was like at the height. I mean, he's already had his Broadway debut. 1904 is when he had his debut. Okay, two years later, he's been in London. He performed before the King. And then, you know, he, he had a bit of a hiccup in, in 1907, but then in 1908 through 1909, he went on tour and uh, with a group. And so he's, He's um, doing very well for himself. In fact, Variety uh, said that he is as great a performer as there is today. And that was in 1910, not 1902. <laughs> too many numbers for that. <laughs> uh, that's way too funny. <laughs> oh, good heavens. Now... In 1911, this is when he, when, when Julian received that iconic role, you know, kind of like how um, Michael J. Fox has Marty McFly and, and yeah, and, and everything. Well, he received <laughs> that one role. So in 1911, there was a show that opened, and he was the one that starred in it. It was called The Fascinating Widow. And in this show, Julian plays the character Hal Blake, who disguises himself as Mrs. Monty in a Charlie's Ant-like plot. And, uh, which I'll, I'll put that in the description because I'm not even going to explain it. That'll be too long. But I'll put what uh, Charlie's aunt like means and, uh, in the description box. So the show only ran for 56 performances in New York, but toured the nation for several years. Now, this this play, this performance, was so successful that the producer um, <laughs> gave Julian one of the highest honors. A theater named after him. And this theater still exists. So those of you who are in New York, here you go. Okay, so there, the um, Eltinge 
Theater. Again, I, I really think I'm butchering that name. So, but the Eltinge Theater opened in on New York's 42nd Street. Which Julian never performed in it, which I thought kind of surprising. He, he yeah, he never performed in, in a building named after him. I would have thought he would, but he didn't. <laughs> the theater, uh, after serving as a legitimate theater for many years, it became a burlesque house and was shut down during a public morality campaign in 1943. And then it became a cinema the next year. The theater is now part of the AMC Empire 25 Cineplex, having been lifted and moved in its entirety down the block from its original location. So it's still there. It's just not in its original location. <laughs> I will uh, put in the description where it is, because, yeah, um, in the description box, all the information for it. So those of you who want to kind of walk by and see um, Julian's Theater go by, I'm sure some of you from New York are going to be like, oh, OK. Yeah, but he never performed in it. I'm kind of surprised that he didn't. Uh, I, I wonder why. Probably kind of, you know, this was still during the time of uh, superstition and everything, so maybe it was like a superstitious thing. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so there were a couple other uh, things. After Fasc The Fascinating Widow, uh, he performed in two other comedies which I'm not even going to try to say the name of that one because I know I will butcher it. And then there was uh, uh, the Cousin Lucy. And then he um, entered Hollywood. And uh, that was in 1914. And the two films like the one that I just, I'm not even gonna try to <laughs> say. I will put it in the description box for you. And um, and then of course, Cousin Lucy, he starred in those films. And um, he, it says he also had a cameo role in a film entitled How Molly Malone Made Good. And that was the next year in 1915. Um, then there was in 1917 where he appeared in The Countess Charming. His role in the film was again a double role with him playing both a male and said male and female garb. So um, he made three films in 1917 and also in 1918. He wrote and produced a vaudeville group called the Julian Elton Papers, uh, Players, I'm sorry, <laughs> again, my dyslexia. Um, with this group, he returned to the vaudeville stage, appearing at New York's Palace Theater in 1918, and uh, where he was paid one of the highest salaries in show business, $3,500 a week. So this is the thing um, to understand is that um, vaudeville was slowly dying at this point in, in late Edwardian, like in 17 and 18. I mean, this was also when, um, let me backtrack. <laughs> Vaudeville was dying and then World War I happened and people were using any kind of entertainment to, I guess you would say, boost morale. <laughs> and so uh, people like Julian um, were doing everything they could to keep vaudeville alive. They did not want it to fizzle out. Because with um, 
Hollywood and moving pictures, vaudeville especially was dying. Broadway was never going to go away. Broadway was doing just fine. But vaudeville was fading. People were going to see the new technology, which was the, the moving pictures. That's what they wanted to see. And actors and actresses were noticing this and they were going to where the money was. But once the war hit, um, again, people like, you know, like Julian were trying to jump on, um, well, can't take advantage, kind of taking advantage of a situation by trying to keep vaudeville alive. And, um, and it kind of worked for a while, but, you know, war did end. <laughs> Unfortunately, but you, you got to give them credit for trying. I mean, it's what they knew, you know, they, they knew the stage and they love the stage. And um, so anyway, so he continued to do film. Uh, he actually appeared with Rudolph Valentino. And um, I've tried to find that film. I have found clips of it, but not the full film. So, I, you know, uh, <laughs> I have tried. And um, he also made a film called uh, Madam Behave and, oh, The Fascinating Widow. That was, <laughs> his iconic role was made into, I did not know that. Well, I just learned something. <laughs> Well, now, this is a sad part is um, the stock market, you know, here he is, he's, he's riding high and everything. He's, you know, he, he's made, he's become very successful and um, on stage and in film and, and everything. And then stock market crash. The thing to understand is uh, a lot of people in show business, the stock market crash destroyed them. I, I saw a documentary and I mean, people were partying like nobody's business before the stock market hit. And, um, and that's why people reacted the way they did. And um, so, yeah, uh, he he was no different, and, and that's what makes it so sad, the, the fact that it's happened, and, you know, you could say, well, they should have known better, you know, how we see buying stock is completely different to what it was then, and part of the reason is because of the stock market crash, <laughs> so um, into the 30s, this is when the impersonation acts, the female impersonation acts, everything that he built his career on. So this, the drag queen acts on stage, they weren't popular anymore. In fact, vaudeville was gone. And um, he was desperate. Uh, he was performing in nightclubs and um, <laughs> basically back to what he did when he was a teenager you think about it if that one story is true where he would perform in cost you know in, in women's clothing in the saloons you know it could be true and uh, I just the the part that I have a problem with is he was doing that and how is it that his dad didn't anyway so me personally <laughs> doesn't mean it's not true. <laughs> I just have a problem with it because how is it that his, his dad didn't know? What did his dad think he was doing? I don't know. Anyway, like I said, me personally, <laughs> doesn't mean you, you can't believe it. You could be like, but what, what is the matter with you? But again, maybe I do believe it. And <laughs> because I'm saying this, 
But um, so here he is. He's he's performing in nightclubs. Well, at the same time, during the 30s, um, there was a crackdown on cross-dressing in public. And um, there was also, and it, there were also attempts to get rid of homosexual activity, couldn't do that anymore openly. And um, so Julian couldn't perform in costume anymore. And uh, in fact, just everything that his career was, he was struggling. And um, so in 1941, while he was performing in a nightclub, he became extremely ill and he was taken home and then later, about 10 days later, he passed away. It says that he died of a, a cerebral hemorrhage. That's just very sad, very, very sad. And, um, and what's interesting, those of you who are Buster Keaton fans, he is referenced in the film Seven Chances. This is the one where uh, Buster has the black eye and, and everything. Yeah, that's the one where it looks like he's beat up and everything. So um, I'll have to watch that movie again because I don't remember Julian being referenced in that movie. But it, it's, it shows his name actually, Julian's name actually in the film. So um, I'll have to watch it again. And that's the only time that Julian is ever referenced anywhere. And um, so, but anyway, so, so Julian, he started at a young age. He was six years old. Again, his, his childhood is a little spotty. Like I said, I, I, I might believe the whole thing with his dad. I I do believe 100% that his dad beat him seeing him dressing in women's clothes. But, you know, I just, with the whole thing with uh, not knowing where his son was, and then all of a sudden, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I do believe it. <laughs> Maybe I do, and I'm just in denial. <laughs> but, um, but he, he, he was like, he was 10 years old uh, in the Boston Cadet Review. This is the thing is female impersonation acts were very popular in, in uh, Victorian and for vaudeville acts. And, and as much as the RuPaul drag race is now. So. <laughs> and far more than I expected. I, I learned that while, while reading up on, on Julian, and um, I have been introduced to a lot more of these female impersonators, and I might do more videos on these um, performers as well. So, but anyway, so this was Julian Elton.